This is Talk Back with Peter Christian and John King, 721-1290 or 1-800-568-5309. This is News Talk KGVO, AM 1290 and 98.3 FM, KGVO, Missoula's news and weather station. Welcome to Talk Back, brought to you by Bullseye Wear, where they have Missoula's only certified master optician, located at 2910 South Reserve in the old RPLS location. Give them a call at 552-1299 or visit online at bullseyemt.com. Also by Selway Armory at 2825 Stockyard Road, Unit E6, more guns and ammo than anyone in Missoula, and the best prices in Montana. Montana's premier firearms dealer. Also by Karis Park Management. The views and opinions expressed on TalkBack are not those of the staff, management, or advertisers. All right. Well, it's Friday. It's a gloomy, kind of rainy, stormy, potentially snow over uh, the weekend Friday. But, hey, it's still Friday, so be happy. We also have, uh, to cheer us up with the weekly crime report, uh, Kirsten Paps, our county attorney. Thanks for calling in, Kirsten. You're very welcome. I don't have a lot of sunshine for you today, though, John. Sorry. Oh, well, we can always hope. Um, one of these days, you'll call in and have nothing to say. I will look forward to that day. <laughs> but what happened this week? Tell us what's going on. We had another fairly busy, moderately busy week um, um, processing 22 new cases through um, uh, six of those I would put in the violent crime or crimes against persons category. That included two violation of orders of protection cases, which are concerning, as you know, because they're kind of part and parcel with the partner family member cell cases. Sometimes they haven't reached that level yet. Sometimes they've exceeded it, but always causes us concern when people ignore court orders like that um, at the peril of someone else. Um, four partner family members slash aggravated assault cases involving pretty serious abuse against a partner family member. Um, we had a holdover assault with a minor case from last week. In the property crimes division, there were three thefts and the criminal mischief. Drugs, we had three felony drug cases, one opiate, one intent to distribute, and then a whole handful of endangerment crimes, including um, a small handful of felony DUIs. What was the holdover child endangerment case? Uh, the, it was the Curran case, one that we talked about last week. Was that the child walking along the highway or the, the child that was bitten? I the can't... child that was bitten. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. So as far as, uh, as, far as things going on, uh, this week seems to be pretty busy compared to uh, you know, our, our, our normal rate of around 20. Yeah, it's pretty busy. We haven't had much of a lull. Um, you know, with the it, we, the crimes are a little bit. The profile's different. The landscape changes periodically. Um, a few less meth cases these last few weeks, but a few more violent cases, and so that's always cause for concern. Yeah. Well, hey, well, let's keep at it, and hopefully we. Uh can have that week. Uh, maybe next week we'll have no crimes. on. Okay, okay? I'll look forward to it. <laughs> I'll prepare for extra things to talk about for that, oh. that gap of uh, five minutes during the opening. Put ourselves out of work. <laughs> All right. Well, Kirsten, thanks so much for calling in. You have a great week, okay? You as well. Thank you. Talk to you later. Bye. All right. Well, that wraps up the uh, weekly crime report from uh, our county attorney. Uh, we're going to switch gears. When we get back, we're going to have a uh, discussion with... Uh, Dr. Schnelling, a geologist who's in the studio with me today. And uh, you might as well get queued up now. I'm pretty sure the phone lines will be full most of the show. Uh, Although geology might not be the thing that gets most people motivated to call into a show. Um, Dr. Schnelling happens to be a creationist, a young earth creationist at that, I believe. And so if you happen to be anywhere on the spectrum from an evolutionist to, uh, you know, or you have questions about this uh, particular uh, belief system. We'd love to get your calls on the air and uh, get them back and forth going between you and Dr. Schnelling, and we'll do that right after the break. Give us a call at 721-1290. Again, that's 721-1290. We'll be back in just a few minutes. Mommy, Daddy put the dent in the car. Russ's body and paint understands that sometimes accidents happen. He was supposed to go backwards, but he went forward. That's why Russ's body and paint is ready with the latest equipment and trained techs. He said words I don't think you're supposed to say. And at Russ's body and paint, we've already been pre-approved by all the major insurance companies. So keep our number close by, 549-9327 on North Russell, just five blocks north of Broadway. Russ's body and paint, where we meet by accident. I'm not supposed to tell. 
Hi, this is Laura with The Spa at the Peak. Thank you for voting The Spa at the Peak a finalist for Best Spa. We are a full-service salon and spa open to the public, located at Peak Health and Wellness on Blue Mountain Road. Our services range from skin care, nails, hair, waxing, and massage. Call us today at 251-8200 to schedule. That's 251-8200. The Spa at the Peak. Some speak of a legend that goes way back. A tale of a deal so good, few believe it even exists. Two dollar filet fish Fridays are real, and I've held it in my own two hands. Wild caught Alaskan Pollock, melted American cheese, creamy tartar sauce on a soft bun. Two dollar filet fish Fridays. It's more than a legend. Head to a participating McDonald's to see for yourself, but hurry, it's for a limited time only. Welcome, everyone. Let's go ahead with roll call. Kevin Yates. Here. Margaret Hansen. Present. Tara... Pterodactyl? Here. You can't always choose your name, but you can choose your favorites with McDonald's McPick 2 menu. Let me get a McPick 2. Make a delicious choice between a tasty McDouble, juicy six-piece chicken McNuggets, a sausage McMuffin, or a sausage burrito. All on the McPick 2 for $3 menu. Price and participation may vary. Limited time only. Uh, that, that's very geological music, I'm sure. I think it's rock. I don't know. Uh, anyway, we are back on the show with uh, Dr. Andrew Schnelling. And uh, first off, let's, well, let's go ahead and let you introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Yes, you can tell from my deep southern accent that I'm not a local. I was born and raised in Sydney, Australia. I studied geology there, worked uh, for the mining industry. But for 30 years now, I've been involved in uh, creation science, research, writing and speaking. And so uh, we're a group of Christians that accept the Bible as a literal record of the Earth's history to be taken seriously. Uh, we, we therefore believe that many of the fossils and the geological layers, catastrophic Noah's flood. And uh, here we are today, descendants of Noah and the, his family that came off, off the ark. And uh, so like, uh, like normal scientists, we, we go out and do research I've done research in the Grand Canyon and other places around the U.S. and uh, over in other other countries. Uh, I live most of my life in Australia, but uh, currently I'm living in northern Kentucky, which is the home base for Answers in Genesis, the ministry that I work with that built the Creation Museum and just recently opened the, the life, life-size life replica of, of Noah's Ark called Ark Encounter. So uh, we're here this weekend in Missoula, uh, the local local folks have banded together to set up the Lake Missoula Creation Conference. We're holding it on the campus of the University of Montana in the ballroom. And uh, the conference is already going now, actually, because there's uh, some sessions this morning for children uh, and uh, high schoolers. And this afternoon, the conference continues for families through the evening and all day Saturday. So aside from your uh, creationist focus... As a geologist, what has been uh, the the focus of your study? What what would you consider yourself an expert in? Uh, I've worked a lot in the dating of rocks. Uh, my my PhD was actually on a uranium deposit in Australia, and for over ten years, I worked as a consultant to the uh, an international project that was looking at what happens to buried nuclear waste, and we were looking at this uranium deposit as a as a parallel to the burial of nuclear waste. So I was interested in radioactive decay and radioactive elements. And so I've been involved in uh, collecting samples, for example, in the Grand Canyon from a number of different rock units there where we sent samples off for radioactive dating, comparing the different methods. And uh, we found a lot of disparity between the methods. I've also looked at other indicators of, of radioactivity in rocks where the rock crystals have been damaged by the radioactive decay and uh, that tells us something about the history of the rocks uh, as as well so my background is in in uh, igneous rocks uh, volcanic rocks granites uh, those kinds of rocks in particular and and in ore deposits that is where we find accumulate high high accumulations of metals and ores that we uh, can 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 mine and use for our modern technology well, you're at the wrong side of the state for mining, but 
apparently Lake Missoula has something to do with your work. So tell people out there how Lake Missoula, which most of the people that live here have heard about, uh, relates to your theories. Yeah, well, during the Ice Age, we all accept that was a, there was an Ice Age because we still have the remnants of that Ice Age on the Earth's surface today with the, the polar ice caps. But the, uh, the, the northern ice sheets came down as far as nor- uh, uh, northern U.S., as, as far as here in uh, the Missoula area. And, in fact, uh, what happened is the ice built up and so much that it blocked the flow of, of water and uh, it was like a, a natural uh, wall of a dam that held back a lake. And so we speak of uh, glacial Lake Missoula. And uh, what happened is that uh, that, that uh, ice lake, that ice dam broke and the water went catastrophically downstream and uh, carved out the channel scablands of the Pacific Northwest. Now, if we, go, if we go back the clock, turn back the clock 100 years, but a lot of people were puzzled about the landscape features they saw in the channel scablands, these cliffs and canyons, dry waterfalls, and there was obvious evidence that there'd been a lot of erosion in the past. But thinking had been so channeled into uh, slow and gradual processes, thinking that only the rates of geological processes that we see operating today were responsible for those sorts of features, canyons and, and, and cliffs and waterfalls and things like that. And there was a, a, a geologist who worked for the US Geological Survey, Harlan Bretz, who looked at these features out here in the Pacific Northwest and uh, Western Montana, and he was the first one to to propose the idea that there'd been this glacial Lake Missoula that had burst catastrophically and carved uh, carved out catastrophically the channel scablands. And he was actually vilified by the geological community for something like 40 years before the, the people began to take a serious look at his ideas and uh, there was a complete switch around, so much so that he ended up getting awarded the Penrose Medal from the Geological Society of America for his outstanding contribution. So he stood against the tide of conventional thinking at that time and, and created a revolution in thinking where geologists today are prepared to accept catastrophes for producing uh, geological features that we see today. So the way that this ties into your worldview, though, would be more of a lesson in how dogmatic one approach can get uh, in its application of, of how processes work. The process of a dramatic kind of cataclysmic break of Lake Missoula and the flood thereafter, can you, do you believe you can cross-apply that to other processes across the globe that people have for a long time uh, thought to have been caused by, you know, slower process. A- absolutely. I've done a lot of work in the Grand Canyon. In fact, in two weeks' time, I'll be on a raft trip through the Grand Canyon, taking people through the canyon. And if you go to most of the textbooks and, and even at the park at the uh, South Rim, you'll see that said that, you know, the Colorado River slowly and gradually carved out the Grand Canyon. But the reality is we can look at John Wendley, Wesley Powell's diary when he went down the, the river through the Grand Canyon in 1869 and uh, drawings that were made subsequently of some of the rapids and some of the features in the canyon, and they haven't changed since John Wesley Powell went down the canyon. That's because the canyon is filling up. You get flash floods in the side streams that dump debris into the main channel of the Colorado River, and the reason why we can do whitewater rafting there today and go over rapids is because even... Under flood conditions, the Colorado River it hasn't been powerful enough to clean out that debris. What does that tell us about the past? Well, the present flow of the Colorado River could never have carved out the Grand Canyon. Everyone agrees that the plateau country through which the Grand Canyon uh, traverses was there before the canyon was. But that creates a problem because the crest of that plateau is at a higher elevation than the headwaters of the Colorado River. And in fact, the Colorado River therefore would have to flow uphill if it was going to carve out the Grand Canyon. Furthermore, instead of going around the plateau, the Colorado River turns a right-hand bend and goes straight through the plateau today. And so that has led a number of people to think in terms of catastrophic processes 
whereby the plateau country pulled was pushed up and it created an inland closed drainage system that developed some huge lakes and similar to Glacier Lake Missoula, the, the water built up and built up and built up. Some of that water went into cracks uh, where you had limestones in the plateau and weakened the rock and eventually there was a catastrophic failure for the water to burst through and a lot of water, a little bit of time, carved out the Grand Canyon. And that makes sense because there, there is very little debris in the canyon. The, 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 the walls of the canyon are clean as if the water was higher in the past. High levels of water just cleaned out all that debris and, and took, it, took it out. In fact, many people now accept that a lot of the debris went and were, didn't go into the present uh, Colorado River Delta. It actually went out into the, towards the Pacific Ocean and dumped the sediments that formed a lot of the uh, Los Angeles Basin. And once those sediments were dumped out there catastrophically, the river ter- did a turn and went south and formed the present Colorado River Delta uh, subsequently. Uh, now, so it's an interesting story. Now, what you're saying about the Grand Canyon, though, that interpretation of the rocks is, a, is different than the general mainstream interpretation, isn't that right? Yes, John, it is different. There are, there are some who are not uh, creationists who do accept some catastrophic processes involved in the Grand Canyon. You see, this is the point. We weren't there in the past. So we can't, as you say, we can't be absolutely dogmatic. What scientists do is, uh, based on what they think might have happened in the past, they construct a model for how things might have happened, and then they take that model and go out and test it against what they observe in the real world. And so the observations then test the model. And as I said a moment ago, we see lack of debris. We see uh, on the walls of the, Colo- of, the, of the canyon, we see the Colorado River presently uh, isn't cleaning out its debris. So that shapes how we, how we test our models. All right. We're going to go to a quick break. If you have a question for Dr. Andrew Snelling or a, uh, a point you'd like to raise, give us a call, 721-1290. We've got all lines open. Again, that's 721-1290. Direct from Las Vegas, Nevada, the entertainment capital of the world, Jordan World Circus is coming your way. It's three rings of non-stop, heart-stopping thrills. You'll soar to new heights as you watch top superstars of the circus world, exotic animal acts, and feats of daring and danger come together for the greatest spectacle on earth. It's an incredible entertainment value for the whole family. Don't miss the Shrine Circus April 7th and 8th at the Adams Center, Missoula. Tickets available at most area grocery stores. Burn Street Bistro has been serving up award-winning brunch, lunch, and weekday breakfast on Missoula's west side for the past five years. Now that spring has sprung, Burn Street Bistro has begun receiving fresh local produce from area farmers, and things have gone from delicious to exquisite. Not to mention, Burn Street's baristas are ready to make you a variety of excellent coffee drinks. Not downtown, not Reserve Street, Burn Street on Missoula's west side. 107.5 107.5 Zoo FM and Garden of Reden invite you to the annual Easter Egg Stravaganza Easter Egg Hunt Saturday, April 15th in its new location. This is Missoula's biggest Easter Egg Hunt that in the past has been held on the University of Montana campus but had to relocate to Loyola Sacred Heart High School's Rollin Field at 1st and California Streets. 30,000 eggs, toys, prizes, concessions, face painting, and more. It's free for all kids age 9 and under. See you Saturday, April 15th at 1 p.m. sharp at Rollin Field with Garden of Reden and 107.5 Zoo FM. At Sunshine Motors, we offer the best pre-enjoyed vehicles in western Montana. Our experienced and friendly sales staff is ready to help you find the awesome car, truck, or SUV you've been looking for. The fast and easy car buying experience you get at Sunshine Motors will be unique and fun. We're here to assist you while researching and purchasing your next vehicle. That's only at Sunshine Motors on Broadway. Offer a reserve next to Costco or on the web at sunshinemotors.com. Sunshine Motors, the sunshine Music is a bridge between the material and the spiritual. My name is Harvey Lauer, and I'm 82. As a blind person, you have to be aware that nobody can tell you what you can or can't do. You really have to try things. My folks got me a little radio in 1940, and that was the best Christmas present I ever got. When I was 11 years old is when I started to... uh, play music, play the piano, and then the accordion, and then the cello. 
My wife, who was also blind, was a good cook. When she died, that's when I started Meals on Wheels. America, let's do lunch. One in six seniors faces the threat of hunger, and millions more live in isolation. Drop off a hot meal and say a quick hello. Volunteer for Meals on Wheels by donating your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. This message brought to you by Meals on Wheels America and the Ad Council. All right, we're back on the Talk Back Show. We're speaking with Dr. Andrew Snelling, a uh, creationist. Uh, he's with the group Answers in Genesis, and we're all. He's also in town for a conference this week. Let's get to the part of the the discussion that I think that receives the most debate. I think probably a majority of Americans are what you would consider a creationist. They believe God created the earth, the universe, whatever. Um, but you're a young earth creationist. And that's part of the discussion that a lot of people have problems with, the whole idea of uh, it just being, you know, whether you're 7 or 9 or 10,000 years, a shorter time than most people are used to. But as a scientist of, of rocks, a geologist, what do you feel is the best case for that young Earth scenario? Well, I, I think that the uh, dating methods are unreliable. I think that the Earth's magnetic field, I think uh, because of its, the way it's been declining, you can't go back far enough in history before it'd be so, uh, so strong that it'd be as strong as a magnetic star. You've got comets, the, the periods of the length of comet orbits. Uh, you've got uh, shaping of the Earth's surface uh, very rapidly by catastrophic processes, doesn't build in millions of years. Uh, so there's lots of, lots of indicators. Uh, radiocarbon, for example, has been found in coal layers that are supposedly three, uh, 300 million years old. In fact, uh, I was involved in, in doing that radiocarbon dating work. We found soft tissue in dinosaur bones. That's very close to, close to home here in Montana <clears throat> because the, uh, the, the, some of those fossils were found in the Hell Creek Formation in eastern, uh, southeastern Montana. And it's still got live tish, um, fresh tissue, uh, blood cells uh, even in them. And so uh, we know from the decay processes, uh, organic materials don't survive very long. And so there's lots of evidence, even in the rocks, that the Earth may not be as old as the conventional wisdom says it is. Do you believe that the Earth was created young along with the universe or that it was created young in a already existing universe? No, because I, I be because one, of my, one of the things I struggle with mm -hmm. with that viewpoint is the idea of light from the stars light from the stars taking so long i mean we know the speed of light and yet we have stars that are sending us light and hitting earth that are thousands and thousands of thousands you know as far as uh, years back there that's so, the next so, that's a, yeah that's an excellent question john and uh, i don't i want to jump in on that very quickly in the interest of time i as a christian look at what jesus did uh, jesus was the, the creator he claimed to be the creator and he walked on water defying gravity. He turned water into wine. He broke bread and, and fish and multiplied five loaves and two fishes and fed thousands of people. Those, those were miracles of creation and they were done instantly. I cannot scientifically explain them. When we go back to the creation week, we're talking about a period where God did things. He spoke and they came into existence. We're told that he created fruit trees already bearing fruit. Why? Because a couple of days later, Adam and Eve would need food. What they if they had to wait for years for trees to mature and, and produce fruit, how, how would they be able to eat? And so when it comes to the creation of the universe, and I believe that uh, that was all done in six literal days because God said in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, that we were to work for six days and rest for one. The only basis for a week on our calendar comes from creation and God said, you will work for six days and rest for one because I work for six days. And, and I created the, the, the heavens, the earth, and everything in them in six literal days. But and we so know that the six literal days aren't exactly the same. Fridays go a lot faster than Mondays. <laughs> That's just basic science. <laughs> it just depends on your perspective. <laughs> but, but truly, uh, when it comes to that activity of God in creation, we, we cannot explain how God did those things just as we can't explain how Jesus did what he did in raising people from the dead and, and curing people instantly. So you're and saying therefore, the light is a miraculous thing. God, God put everything in place because we're told that the sun, moon, and stars were there for signs and seasons. 
And so Adam and Eve had to be able to see the same stars as we did after the, uh, you know, two days after everything was created. And so I believe that God created a fully functioning, mature universe right from the start. Uh, yes, today we know that light travels at a certain speed, but God is capable of putting everything in place, perfectly functioning for what he intended and, and putting man in there right from the beginning. And so scientifically, we cannot fathom how God did that because we're finite, fallible human beings and we're limited by the world in which we're living in today. We can't go back in a time machine to observe what God actually did and how he did it. All right, let's go to callers, starting with Bruce. Bruce, you're on the air. Thanks for calling in today, sir. Hey, good morning, you guys. Um, I'd like to make a point about the dinosaur soft tissue. The uh, the soft tissue they extracted from a T-Rex bone was mineralized, and they had to go through many processes to get it back to soft tissue. They didn't pull soft tissue out of the ground. And uh, my other point is we can't use the construct of time to measure God, because I believe God exists outside of time. He's almost a quantum entity, and for what what we consider time might not even exist for God. You're quite right, Bruce. God exists out of time, uh, outside of time. He He lives in eternity, and he made time, and we are creatures of time. As for the soft tissue, uh, you mightn't realize it, but uh, someone else uh, took a brow horn from the Hell Creek Formation and opened it up, and there was unmineralized uh, soft tissue in it. So not all of the soft tissue had to be treated to, to demineralize it. That, in that instance, and it was uh, published in Acta Histochemica in 2014 uh, from a brow horn of a, a uh, triceratops, and they actually found the bone osteophytes. These are specialised cells with, with fine filopoda that were totally intact and were not mineralised at all. So uh, these discoveries, and, and Mary Schweitzer and her colleagues have found more uh, in further bones and so it, it's, there's quite a, a, a data bank now of evidence for this uh, discovery of soft tissue and, and cells. Ziploc fresh. All right. Hey, we'll be back after this quick break. We'll uh, take a call from, it looks like Marilyn is in the queue. And we can take a call from you as well at 721-1290. We have three lines open. We'll be back after a quick break with Dr. Andrew Schnelling. This message is for you. Imagination Station, downtown Missoula, corner of Higgins and Broadway, is Bunny Headquarters for creative, fun, healthy, happy baskets. Imagination Station is filled floor to ceiling with classic toys, outdoor games, and equipment from kites to croquet, briar horses, calico critters, trucks, baby dolls, crazy errands, thinking putty, and more. Find Imagination Station on Facebook for sweet basket ideas. Always free gift wrapping. Imagination Station, the toys you loved as a child. Some bunnies shop here. At Go- Diesel, they know your truck is one of your biggest investments and that you depend on it for your lifestyle. So don't settle for second best when it needs parts or repair. Head directly to the professionals at Gomer's U.S. Diesel Parts and Service. Your truck takes care of you, so you should take good care of your truck with respect and expertise. It's what your truck deserves. West Broadway and Palmer in Missoula and online at usdieselparts.com. Treating you great since 1938. Gomer's U.S. Diesel Parts. They say you can't take on the man and win. That one small company doesn't stand a chance against the corporate behemoths with all their money and lawyers. But they don't know Harry's. How's Harry's done it? Simple. By owning the factory and selling directly to you. Harry's sells their incredible razor blades online. They ship directly from their site to you and do it for a lot less. And while those other guys rake in huge profits, Harry's passes the savings directly back to you. The result? A quality shave and more money in your pocket. Don't believe it? Try Harry's for yourself for free. Just pay 3 bucks in shipping when you sign up. Your set comes with a razor, shave gel, travel cover, and a post-shave balm. That's an almost $20 value free. There's no catch and no commitment. You can cancel anytime. And quality is always guaranteed. So go to harrys.com now and enter code 1212 at checkout. That's harrys.com, code 1212. Again, 1212. All right, we're back.
back on the Talk Back Show. Dr. Andrew Snelling is in the studio taking your calls, which we're going to jump right into. Uh, let's see here. First, we got Marilyn. Marilyn, you're on the air. Thanks for calling in. Good morning. I've been waiting for this show all week. Okay. I am a young earth, six-day, believe God created the earth and heaven in, all, in that short time. So glad you're here. Okay. There are many ways that the leftist evolutionists try and indoctrinate people into the their fact that there is no God and he didn't create the heaven and the earth. So is when they talk about fossil fuels, isn't that one of their ways to get everybody off track? Can you tell me if our energy deposits are truly made from fossils? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you, you look at coal under the microscope and Thanks, you, Marilyn. you can yep. see, uh, Marilyn, the uh, tissues of plants, you can see the, the uh, cellular structure of wood, you see uh, spores, pollen spores, you see the structure of leaves. And so, yes, coal is a result of um, organic debris, primarily uh, woody plants that were catastrophically buried and uh, covered up. We, we saw, uh, as you probably know, we saw a, a microcosm of this happen at Mount St Helens uh, after the 1980 eruption when there was lots of vegetative debris on Spirit Lake and uh, it, it, it sank and got buried and it started to coalify. Oil is primarily from algal material. Uh, you, can, you can find chemical markers, that is chemical components of oil that is only found in plant material. And uh, what I like to point out to people is that even in, in judgment, when God was judging the world and wiping out all life, including all the plant life, he, he has allowed some of that to get buried uh, to produce the coal and oil that we now use in the present world. So even in judgment, God was being merciful in providing us resources that we'd be able to use in the, in the post-flood world. Uh, I said earlier that uh, we find radiocarbon in oil, we find radiocarbon in coal. Uh, there's been lots of studies uh, done on that. And, and while the conventional scientific community doesn't recognise that, it's even been published in their own literature that there's radiocarbon. Now, radiocarbon uh, decays very rapidly. It has a short period of, uh, of decay. And normally, it's only uh, within, within 10 half-lives, about 57,000 years, there's virtually so little radiocarbon left that it can't be measured. So that means that the coal and oil is only thousands of years old if we use the assumptions that the conventional scientific community use to interpret the radiocarbon uh, compositions that are found in the coal and oil. So that tells us it's recent. It wasn't millions of years ago. And in fact, uh, the coals that are supposedly millions of years difference in age have the same amount of radiocarbon content, which means that the plant material was all living at the same time and buried at the same time only thousands of years ago. So fossil fuels is a, is a, 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 a reasonable term to use because these are fuels that are being generated by plant material, in particular, being buried and fossilized. Uh, there is a theory out there about uh, petroleum that it's being constantly produced at the very lowest levels of the ocean. Um, when you look at the radiocarbon in petroleum, does that match up, or do you see? Well, yeah, that, um, improbable. Well, there was discovery. There's a discovery made in the last fifty or so years where they found hot water springs on the bottom of the ocean. And when they investigated some of these in the Gulf of California, in the Guaymas Basin, there was hot, hot water, bu volcanic water bubbling up through the organic ooze on the ocean floor, and it was actually producing globules of oil right there and then. And over in Australia, where I come from in southern Australia, there are coal beds that uh, are, are found near on land, but the, the beds dip down under the ocean, and they're on, on the ocean floor where they're at a deeper, deeper level, and the oil and, natural, oil and natural gas has been produced from that coal, uh, which we exploit uh, with offshore oil and, and gas wells. And uh, experiments that have been done indicate that as the temperature and pressure is applied to that coal, it produces the oil. And some of those oil reservoirs are actually being replenished as we take out the coal and oil. So, yes. So back to Marilyn's question, though. Uh, fossils, yes, but the process of those being fossils is a lot quicker than a lot of people assume. Exactly. In fact, fossils 
you need a very rapid burial process to preserve fossils. If you leave a dead cow out in the paddock, it's going to get rot and be eaten very rapidly. If you want to fossilise it, you've got to cover it up very quickly. And it's the same with plant material that goes into these fossil fuels. All right, let's take a call from Alan. Alan, you are on the air. Thanks for calling in, sir. Yeah, good morning. Good morning, Alan. Are you familiar with uh, Dr. David Alt's uh, work and his book, Glacier Lake Missoula and its humongous floods? I heard you talk about Glacier Lake Missoula earlier. Yes, yes. Uh, in his book, he indicates that there's been numerous floods. Do you agree with that? Well, because of the debris that is brought down by a glacier, yes. There's, the Lake Missoula flood, flood was the primary one, but there is evidence of other, uh, other lakes and uh, lakes being refilled and breaking through again. So there's a multiplicity of that. The, the geologists even talk about uh, a, uh, a flood uh, down into uh, Utah as a result of a, a, a breakthrough of waters in the, uh, 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 one of the main rivers out there to the west. And so uh, they even talked about it over uh, in the east as well. So, yes, there are many places around the world where there's evidence of uh, flooding events like the glacial Lake, Lake Missoula. But many of those are on the current lands, landscape that were probably residual effects after the main event, the global flood spoken of in the book of Genesis. How, how many ice ages do you feel the Earth has experienced? Just the one main ice age with, with some advance and retreat of the glaciers with fluctuations. There's indications that uh, there was a, a, a very rapid build-up of ice because during the flood, with all the release of volcanic water, the oceans were hotter, and uh, you, need, you need more evaporation, not cold conditions, but warm conditions to get more evaporation. But that moisture was dumped up on the land, which was cooler, and it built up the ice. There were some fluctuations with some of the glaciers coming down and retreating, but it was in a very short time span. So one major, major ice age and the effects of it we see on the current land surface and the remnants of it we see in the polar ice caps and the mountain glaciers. Now, now do you have, are there any geological theories as to why an ice age occurred? Yes, there is a theory that uh, the, the solar cycle was such that you had uh, changes in the amount of uh, solar radiation reaching the Earth and it, it generated cooler conditions. The trouble is if you get cooler conditions, you don't get the same amount of evaporation and the, the cold air doesn't hold the moisture. And so that theory uh, really doesn't hold up. And even though they talk about fluctuations in the Earth's orbit, if you look at the, the geological deposits that they claim line up with those uh, fluctuations, there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. And so it, it's tenuous at best, that idea. The, the, the idea of the biblical flood makes better sense because you have warmer ocean waters, you have the right conditions, and you'll generate an ice age very rapidly. All right. Uh, Alan, i got to go to a break. Speaking yep, of fluctuations, we've got to fluctuate out of our regular program. Thanks, and Alan. Some uh, you know, advertising so we can make some money. And when we get back, I want you to talk about the flood geologically. Uh, where did the water come from? That sort of thing. If you could answer those questions uh, in your world view, that'd be great when we come back from this quick commercial break are in store at Bob Ward Sports and Outdoors. Spring sports are heating up and the gear is arriving daily. Save on the brands you love for baseball, softball, soccer, lacrosse, and more. Heading into the woods for early season camping and hiking just got warmer with new rain gear, insulated jackets, and waterproof boots. See all that spring will bring at Bob Ward Sports and Outdoors. Bob Ward Sports and Outdoors, Montana style, celebrating 100 years of outfitting Montanans. Slide in for savings now at Dave Smith. Our bases are loaded with over 1,000 new Chevys, GMCs, and Buicks. Receive a home run deal. Enter to win a new 2017 Chevy Silverado 1500. Find out why we have been the Northwest's largest GM dealer since 1994. 800-635-8000. DaveSmiths.com. Take advantage of exceptional Cadillac offers at Dave Smith Cadillac. Choose from a huge selection of new Cadillacs during the spring's best event. DaveSmithCadillac.com. Do you hear that sound? If you're a satellite customer, you know what that means. April showers bring TV outages. 
It's time to do some spring cleaning and get rid of that dish and switch to Spectrum. Spectrum has over 200 free HD channels, and you can expect to see your crystal clear picture even during bad weather. Switch to Spectrum. Just call 844-855-2999. Spectrum Internet has the fastest starting speeds available for the price at 60 megabits per second with no data caps. That's enough speed to power all of your devices. Oh, and it's 20 times faster than that 3 megabits per second DSL Internet service satellite tries to pair you up with. Call 844-855-2999 and get Spectrum TV, Internet, and voice services for only $29.99 a month each when bundled. Start enjoying entertainment on your terms. Call 844-855-2999. Spectrum. Contract-free, risk-free, hassle-free. Restrictions apply. Call for details. All right. Uh, We are doing the safety dance in here, uh, despite all the floods and cataclysms. Uh, Get to the question about how you think the flood happened, etc. But first... Uh, Some comments from Facebook. Randy says, in some part, I believe this is how we got to Trump being elected because people believed what brought them comfort and made them feel good versus what was actually true. Um, Let's see. Uh, Katie says, where do you believe the water came from and where did it go? I guess that ties in with the flood question. So let's go there. Yes, well, the Bible says that. Uh, No one heard you there for the first bit there. Go ahead. Back to the Bible says that the uh, fountains of the deep great broke open at the beginning of the flood. The windows of heaven were open, and it rained for 40 days and 40 nights torrentially all around the globe. Now, the, that means there were springs on, of the deep, which reply, refers to the ocean floor. And even today, we still see the remnants of those springs at the mid-ocean ridges, where we also have volcanic activity that's producing new ocean floor. So we believe that the water's... Much of the water came from inside the earth to join the water that was already on the earth. But what happened, of course, is uh, new molten rock is warm and expands. And that's why we have the mid-ocean ridge, because the the rock has expanded and it's less dense and it, 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 it rises a little bit. And so it produces that mountain chain. So if you've got all this new ocean floor forming rapidly... It's going to push up sea level with all the rainfall as well. It's going to flood over the continents. Now, the interesting thing is, of course, at the end of the flood, as the ocean floor cools and uh, the springs uh, slow down, then uh, the ocean floor is going to sink. It's going to get cold and dense and sink, and the water is going to drain off off the the continents back into the present-day ocean basins. Many people think, oh, do you have to explain how the ocean waters covered Mount Everest during the flood? No, Mount Everest wasn't there before the flood. It's actually made up of fossil-bearing sedimentary rocks that were produced during the flood. And here's another interesting thing, John. On, On the continents, we find these sedimentary layers that are full of marine fossils. These are creatures that lived on the ocean floor. You would you would normally expect that they would have been buried and fossilized on the ocean floor. No. They've been buried and fossilised on the continents and many of the mountains are made up of these fossil-bearing sedimentary layers that have marine fossils in them, even marine fossils near the top of, the, of, of Mount Everest. And so this implies that the ocean waters covered the continents because we've got marine fossils that were picked up as the fountains of the Great Deep opened, as the ocean basin was, was stirred up with uh, tsunamis with, from earthquakes and, and tides moving currents and surges up onto the continents. It swept up these marine creatures and dumped them in the eroded material, the sediments, up on the continents. And and some of these sediment layers, we can trace them from the Grand Canyon, for example, exposed in the walls of the Grand Canyon. We can trace them right across North America, up into Canada, over into the Appalachians. Some of these layers can be found on other continents with the same fossils. And so we're talking about global-scale processes that have a result of the ocean waters rising and flooding the continents and burying marine creatures. So when it comes to, I mean, one of the things that a lot of people have a hard time with when it comes to creationists is the idea that all of the animals that were, you're from Australia, Mm -hmm. you have some weird critters over there, which I'm sure you know of, and and, and also weird animals too. Um, And when it comes to (laughs) the uh, creatures all across the globe, how did you get so remarkably different and isolated? I mean, usually when evolutionists point to something as, as a, a strong indicator of evolution, they point to, you know, 
uh, birds of one genus uh, changing based on their habitat. Um, they point to places like Australia where you have radically unique different kind of marsupials than you do elsewhere. How does a creationist deal with that? That's a good question. And the answer, first of all, we have to recognize that the Bible de- describes animals as in kinds, created kinds, doesn't use the same taxonomic cl- classification system, which the, which we do, but actually that classification system we used was actually developed by Linnaeus, who was a creationist. And uh, when you look at what animals can interbreed with one another, you know, lions and tigers can interbreed, so they're part of the cat kind. Uh, that means that there are only a pair of cats on the ark and all the, all the cats that we have today have bred from the varieties of... All those varieties have been bred from the animals that got off the ark. Now, when animals like kangaroos and, and koalas got off the ark... We have to remember there was only pairs, so they both had to go in the same direction. Otherwise, that would be the end of the end of kangaroos. And so populations moved in the one direction. Uh, in the post-flood world, we had the Ice Age that we referred to just recently. Uh, during Because of the water transferred onto the continents as a result of the glaciers and the ice, the sea level ru- uh, fell and there were land bridges so that animals could migrate. So koalas and kangaroos went down through Asia and went across into Australia uh, where they got ahead of their predators and, and survived, and then the ocean waters rose at the end of the Ice Age and they were cut off in, in Australia. DNA uh, science has caught up really quickly over the past 20 years. Mm-hmm. When you look at DNA of lions, for example, since you're, that was your, ex, uh, your evidence there, um, I mean, does it trace back to a Adam and Eve lion from the Ark, well, or does it show that it goes back further or different than that? No, there's, there's uh, like, for example, with the, with the cats and lions and tigers, their, their genomes are so very similar, the genetic details are so much similar, that, it, you know, it's, it's the, inf- the same information is there, but it can be, can be pre- expressed in different ways with each generation that, that allows you to get varieties. As far as humans are concerned, yes, even the conventional scientific community talk about uh, an Eve from which we're all descended. They have a different time scale. They have a different place where she lived. But that we recognise there's a commonality of what constitutes human DNA. And even though there's been some debate, most uh, scientists now recognise, for example, the Neanderthals were fully human. And that's that's... That's uh, verified by the archaeological evidence of the tools they have, the musical instruments they had, the things that they did. And so uh, they were fully human, even though they were different from us. I mean, let's face it, we look different from one another, but genetically, when you look at the basic genetics, we have virtually the same uh, genetic information. It's just been expressed differently through through uh, our parents when, when we were... Um, we were we were born. All right, let's go to a quick break. If you have a question or a comment, feel free to call 721-1290. That's 721-1290. We'll be back after a quick break. Pumpernickel fans, your long wait is over at Bagels on Broadway. You mean my pumpernickel patience has paid off? Only at Bagels on Broadway. Our pumpernickel bagels make fabulous breakfast sandwiches and lock sandwiches. And if you've never tried a pumpernickel bagel, we have free samples at the counter. So I can partake of pumpernickel pieces prior to purchase. Precisely. And of course, it's not all about the bagels. We also have smoothies, homemade soups, and our famous Cobb salads. At Bagels on Broadway, we're making bagel magic every day. Life's a little different at the ranch. From our pristine link style course, superb restaurant, to lounging by the pool, the Ranch Club is Montana's most affordable golf club. Now, for a limited time, junior family memberships for those 29 and under are only $210 a month, and for those 30 to 34 memberships are only $265 per month. Full family, senior, and social memberships are also available, and all memberships have no initiation fee. Call 532-1000 or visit theranchclub.com for more information. The Ranch Club. Welcome to the ranch. All right, we're running out of time on Talk Back. We've got just a few minutes left. Hey, before we do run out of time, though, I want to give you a chance, Dr. Schnelling, uh, to talk about what you're doing this week in Missoula. Yes, I got in yesterday. We started a conference last night on the uh, campus of the University of Montana in the uh, Student Activity Center in the ballroom on the third floor. And everyone is welcome. It's a free event. 
And uh, right now there are sessions for uh, kids going on with Ken Ham and uh, Buddy Davis. And this afternoon we have sessions for all the family going through tonight and also tomorrow there'll be workshop sessions for kids paralleling the sessions for the adults tomorrow morning and uh, through the afternoon. So we're talking about uh, the flood, we're talking about fossils, uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about this afternoon. I'm going to be talking about the age of the earth tomorrow. We're talking about, uh, others are talking about the races. Why do we have all the different skin shades that we have today? And uh, if you want to, if you can't get to the conference, then you can look on Facebook because it's being live streamed. Uh, just go to uh, lakemasulaflood.org and uh, you'll, you'll be able to get into the live stream and uh, follow on the conference from the comfort of your own home. And do you have a personal website? Someone was asking about that. Yes, uh, our website is answersingenesis.org, www.answersingenesis, uh, all one word, dot org. All right, let's go to a caller. Dave, you are on the air. Yeah, I have a couple questions. One, were there dinosaurs on the Noah's Ark? And number two... Uh, about, let's ask, let's get him to ask that okay. answer that one, then we'll go to number two. Okay, absolutely, because the Bible says that all the land dwelling, air breathing creatures, two of every kind, went on board the ark, and there was about fifty, sixty dinosaur kinds, and therefore there would have been young dinosaurs, not big old dinosaurs, just young ones, because after they got off the ark, they're going to have to get married and have kids to repopulate the world, and so young dinosaurs were easier to care for; they were smaller. Uh, most dinosaurs are only the size of a bison or less, even a sheep, and so they didn't take up a lot of lot of uh, room. So, in your view, all the theropods, Gigantosaurus, Tyrannosaurus, they're all just one family, one parent of BB. Well, you've got the theropods and you've got the sauropods. They're, they're different families, and so they only have two. They, they can, if they interbreed with one another, we can't check that out today, but we can. We can tell more or less because of the similar similar structural features of these uh, physiological features of these critters that they might have been in about 50 or 60 different family groupings. And so there would have only been 50 or 60 pairs of dinosaurs on board the ark and young, small dinosaurs. Uh, your next question, Dave. Yeah, about chimpanzees. Now, from what I've read, we can get a transfusion from chimpanzees and do just fine. Now, if the blood type's right. Now, are were they part of our family? No. Uh, in fact, you'll find that now that they're looking at full genome sequences for both humans and chimpanzees, that there's, uh, there's about a 15 to 20% difference in the genome between a chimpanzee and a human. And so they weren't part of our, our family. Uh, they, do, they do have features that are similar. That's because a, an engineer who designs different bridges will use similar structural features because they work. And so we would argue that there are similarities like in the hands and, and the facial features, the jaws and teeth between a primate and a human. That's because the creator used similar structures for, to accomplish similar purposes. So it's a common designer and creator rather than a, a common ancestor. All right. Uh, thanks for your call, Dave. Let's go yep. to Alan. Alan, uh, I think it's the same Alan. We'll see. Yeah, it is. I apologize for calling back, but I I may have missed it. You may have said, Doctor, how old is, in your estimate, is the planet Earth? Oh, about 7,000 years old, there, thereabouts. Okay. 7,000 years old. And and where are you located? I, our ministry is based in northern Kentucky in the greater Cincinnati area, just west of the Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky International Airport, and uh, our Answers in Genesis office is at the Creation Museum, and we've also built the Ark Encounter about 40 oh, okay. miles away. Okay, I, I am familiar. I haven't been there, but I am familiar. I, I appreciate that. I, I found this thing very fascinating. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. You're welcome. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks for your call, Alan. All right, so we're, we're almost out of time. Um, I guess my question for you is... Um, Recently, there's been new science about uh, DNA and the way that we can change and modify it using uh, basically scissors that can go in. And we can do this not just with humans, but all living creatures. Um, some people will say that's a point of, of confluence, that that's an indicator that we all come from the same genetic background. How do you as a creationist deal with that? Well, for, uh, for starters, uh, John, 
scientists exercise intelligence to design how they do those genetic manipulations. It's not a random process, so it's done with intelligent input. And the other thing is we have to be very careful. You may remember some years ago we heard about cloning of of a sheep called Mm -hmm. Dolly. Well, in actual fact, the cloned individual died earlier than expected because it created problems. So we have to be very careful. Genetic manipulation uh, like that, if if it's too outside the narrow field of uh, genetics within the specific created individual, the uh, kind, then cross, cross, at cross, it can be at cross purposes and create problems. So what I'm so talking about careful. here is, and I'm not saying we shouldn't be careful, but what I'm talking about is this technology they call CRISPR, uh, C-R-I-S-P-R, C-R-I-S-P-R, I forget the acronym, it's a long acronym. Um, but they found they can use it to cut open and uh, insert new DNA into a human. They can also do it into a tree. They can do it into basically anything. Um, and that commonality, you feel, is just a link because we come from the same creator? Correct. Yes. Yes. And, and we have to be careful. You know, technology can be Five used seconds. for good or for evil. All right. That's and- it. We're actually out of time. Thanks for listening.